First, the key to start right is the stillness. You just have to have enough stillness in your life to hear yourself think and what you want to do. Because I truly believe that with a stillness practice, you can change every aspect of your life. So that is the start. And then I'd say knowing the reason you're doing what you're doing is extremely important to keep you energized. And then don't be afraid to seize the second. And when I say that, what I mean is opportunity for you to move towards your goals or to achieve them, you'll find it in your stillness because you'll be more present. And you have to have the courage to seize that second, allow yourself to move forward and you know, reach for the goal. And so many people are unwilling to, to reach for it or receive whatever it is they're trying to, to do because they're afraid. This is the Player Position Podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up, because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Hello, hello, Team PYP. Mary Lou Kayser here. Welcome to another episode of the Play Your Position podcast. Today is game day here at PYP, and you know what that means. I've got a terrific guest suited up and ready to take us into the world of wealth advisoring and course creation and what it means to lead in a world that continues to evolve. His name is Ken Cladoris. Ken! Are you ready for kickoff? Oh, I'm ready. Let's go, Mary Lou. (laughs) Okay. So as I mentioned, Ken is an esteemed wealth advisor and a leader in the self-mastery movement who has developed an online course entitled Stillness to Success to help people cut through the noise, find their stillness, and create the success they want in life. Ken compiled this course with practical and impactful lessons he extracted from years of his own self-study with a spin that is fresh and relevant to the 2021 world we are all experiencing. Outside of the office, Ken's love of the ocean led him to pursue sailing. It is there that he also found his passion to give back to the community. In his spare time, Ken can be found with friends and loved ones aboard a powerboat, sailboat, or at community events. So, Ken, are you aboard a sailboat or powerboat now by chance? (laughs) I wish. (laughs) I bet. Oh, my gosh. And, team, just so you know, Ken is uh, talking to us today from Newport, California, which is one of the most beautiful places on the planet with lots of boats and lots of water. And, oh, my gosh, uh, here in the spring in the northern hemisphere, it's hard to beat being out on a boat, isn't it? Oh, it is. There's nothing better. (laughs) There's nothing better. Well, listen, because you are our guest today, Ken, my first question is about you and your call to leadership. So would you be so kind as to tell us when did you get the call to leadership and how did that impact how you are currently playing your position? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mary Lou, and uh, excited to be here with with you today. Call to Leadership started pretty early in my career. I've been a wealth advisor for over a decade now. And within a few years, upper management had kind of groomed me to take over regional positions and things like that. So it's been, it's been, a, been a fun ride. Mm. What attracted you to entering the wealth advisory field? I mean, of all the things... You could have done within finance, right? There's a lot of directions you could go. What what attracted you to that? Yeah, I think that for me, really, I think everybody loves money. <laughs> and by that, I mean, usually they want to have more of it, be able to, you know, support their lifestyles, charities, whatever it may be. And early in my career, I thought that being in wealth management would give me the opportunity to help more people become better with their finances and you know create that life that they they wanted to have mm-hmm. what's the hardest thing about being a wealth advisor today what are some of the challenges that you see in 
with people building wealth for themselves? Yeah. So there's a couple of different things that I'd, I'd say are challenging. One, there is a lot of noise out there, right? So whether it's, hey, should I own this stock or should I buy a cryptocurrency? Hey, I saw an ad for some passive income investment. Like, There's just so much data being thrown at individuals that people kind of lose their way, if you will, if they don't have proper guidance. And then the worst is obviously when a client does something without telling you and then comes back and says, hey, no, that didn't work. And now our plan is way off track. So that is the toughest part. Mm. Okay. So you are in conversation with a lot of different people who sometimes take your advice and sometimes don't. What happens when in, in that scenario that you just described, it, it, have you learned some ways to kind of bring them down off the ledge? I mean, I know that's metaphorical, of course, but when people are like, wait a minute, I went off script, Ken, and here's where I'm at. I mean, how for anybody who works with others and, and all of us have clients, what happens when a client goes rogue, <laughs> you know, and you have to rope them back in and get them back on track? Yeah, I think that would be a very specific to the the player, if you will, right? There's some that learn from the lessons and others that are going to repeat the uh, the same mistakes, if you will. And when you look at your team, you have to decide whether, right, that individual is a good fit and going to get you the support that you need from them so that you can get them to the end zone, or if they're constantly going to be fumbling the ball and <laughs> not being able to move forward, right? And then it's like a business decision at that point of whether that's a good match or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you created this course, which has a very intriguing title, Stillness to Success. It seems in a way completely opposite to what you were describing earlier with all the noise of you know, the ads for building your wealth portfolio for retirement. I mean, we, we all can picture these, these ads, whether you see them in the print or you see them on television or they're a pop-up as you're cruising around the internet. What made you, outside of the noise, what is this course about, Ken, and how does it help people with having a great life that includes building their wealth? Yeah. So I took a little bit of what I'd learned in wealth management and combined it with what I'd learned as an individual. And that's where the stillness to success method came to, came to be. So a little background on that is I've always done, you know, the finance side of the business I was doing wealth management, MBA in finance, undergrad in finance. So that was really, you know, where my life was going. And I got to a point where I felt that I'd plateaued, was kind of living in a routine, but I knew that I could do better. You know, and I feel like that happens to a lot of people I talk to and clients. We were having that conversation and that led me to really find my stillness and meditation practice. And then through that, uh, I was able to find out what I really wanted, what was important to me, and then create alignment in my life so that I could easily as possible move forward to my goals and the life I wanted to live. And so it was very interesting in most of my networking or client meetings, as we'd kind of had that discussion, because it shifted, everybody would be intrigued about how I could spend five days in silence or just how much more energy I brought to the room or my presence and everybody mentioned it. And so that's kind of where I was like, oh, clearly people need this information. I'm going to combine right, a decade worth of wealth management with my stillness practice and help people create that alignment. Mm, so interesting. Who is someone that influences you, Ken? Who do you turn to perhaps that has guided you on your stillness journey? And, and was a, a, do you have a, a, an author that you read or do you work with a coach or mentor? What has that relationship been like for you? So early on in my meditation journey, I read basically 
anything that anybody wrote. You know, I was <laughs> just fun. absorbing, yeah, <laughs> absorbing as much information as I could. I did some transcendental meditation retreats, uh, Deepak Chopra had a facility about an hour south of where I live. So I did a couple of events at their facility there and really, like I said, just took in as much information as I could. And then really it dwindled down though at the end to the biggest, you know, bang for the buck or the best momentum I was getting was coming literally from meditation. So. Fascinating. Fascinating. So do you, in conversations with clients, uh, weave in, you, I mean, you, you mentioned that people were noticing your presence, that something had shifted in you. Do you openly discuss your meditation practice, the, the, your commitment to, to stillness with clients? Yes. I think that, and that's kind of why I created the course, right? Because so many people have, in my opinion, this idea that if you're meditating, right, you're doing you know, Reiki and you've somehow gone off the deep end and <laughs> right. Like you can't be in business and do that. And in just having conversations with people at retreats, a lot of them were, you know, executives, top surgeons, different things, super successful people that just weren't having that conversation. And so since I wrote the book and created the course, it was kind of hard for me not to have the conversation mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to shift that stigma to, you know, you can meditate and be extremely successful. They go hand in hand because meditation is a personal experience and how you experience your business relationships, personal relationships, your money is all a personal experience. So if you show up better, you'll have a better experience. Mm. I love that mission. I think that's fantastic. And I think that being willing to openly talk about what you do with clients makes you even more attractive to the people that want to work with you because you are sharing your journey of, of self-discovery, which is really the only journey any of us is on. You know, that's at the root of this show is that when you show up and be yourself, you win and not because you're competing, but because you're evolving, because you're discovering. And the fact that you, you entered an industry that has its own stigma, doesn't it? It, it, the wealth industry, the, there are people who have ideas about what money is and what money isn't there. Are, there are attitudes about, you know, very wealthy people and, here you are saying, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, these two things can go hand in hand. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm curious, Ken, about a time during this journey you've been on when you found yourself playing out of position, when things did not go according to your game plan, you were metaphorically sacked, got intercepted, or you fumbled the ball. What caused this to happen? And then what was the lesson that you walked away with? Yeah, I mean... I feel like early on in my journey, there was a, a lot of that and a lot of maybe running out of bounds and not realizing you're out of bounds and then, oh, got to get back on the field. So I think it comes down to, and for me specifically, right, it was just working through kind of belief systems and habits, right? Anytime you're going to change, it's difficult. And so as I was progressing towards change, right, anytime I would fall, it was like extremely hard. And then I was hard on myself for making the mistake. And I feel like more than, you know, fumbling the ball, it was walking to the sidelines afterwards, having that conversation in my head of like, why would you do that? How did you do that? Like, what's wrong with you? Right. And then that continually just doubting myself on the journey I was on. And then, you know, that was the biggest learning experience for me is realizing that that conversation I was having in my head wasn't necessarily true. And I was just evolving and then finding again, mentors to help me kind of clear those beliefs, have a stronger conversation with myself. And then eventually, you know, quieting down all of that noise internally. Mm-hmm. 
What was one of the beliefs that you had that you don't anymore? Oh, there's a lot. You could just so, couple. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would say on the money side, you know, I grew up in a household where there was money or there wasn't. And there was always that, right? Money doesn't grow on trees. And, right, you need to save money, hold money. And it's interesting because being in a wealth management position, you have conversations with people that can make a ton of money doing almost anything. And so I had this, these two beliefs of, you know, growing up my entire life with, right, money is scarce to having conversations with people who might believe money is scarce, but are making millions of dollars a year doing anything. And so once I realized that I had that belief, it changed my behaviors on what I was willing to use the energy of money to create. Mm. Boy, the money stories that we grow up with are so powerful. And I know you're not alone as a young man growing up in a home where you heard that story that, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. That is a cliche. And, and yet how many people who are listening either heard that too or know someone who did? And then for you to enter your professional life and see that, well, it may not grow on trees, but it's definitely not scarce. I mean, that must have been that that conflict that you felt is, again, it's a powerful conflict. And so is there one person that that or a book that you read, Ken, that really helped you make that transition from believing that money is scarce to a, more of an abundance mindset? I can't think of like one exact moment. What I would say is that through my stillness practice, as I shed more and more of my belief systems and really just got to the core of who I was and what I was thinking, mm -hmm. that process was allowed me to drop that belief. Mm. It really is a process. It really is a process. It, it, having gone through my own, and I've talked to several people on the show over the years who, like you, we're facing some belief system transitions. You know, for people listening, be, I, I, I loved what you said earlier about you would go to the sidelines side and you would hear, you started to beat yourself up. And then thankfully there were people in your life who recognized that and said, hey, you're growing, it's okay. And through that process, you were able to quiet the inner critic that was quick to you know, channel the old belief system as you were building your new one. And it really is that process of letting go of what you used to think and embracing 100% what you now think. So I'm really, thank you for taking us into something as personal as that, because that's where change happens. That's where change happens. Right. That's where, that's where real change happens. And, you know, that's why the course you know, that like when I created it, it was like, it has to start with the stillness practice so people can start to experience, right, the, the quieting of that inner noise and really hearing their true thoughts as opposed to, right, all of the internal conflict that they have. Mm -hmm. It's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast, and we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. Now, let's get back to the game. We live in a time where there is a lot of craziness going on. And that inner conflict, I think, is at an all-time high. At least that's my impression. I have no scientific evidence to prove that. I just spent a lot of time talking with people, reading, and we are living in a massive time of transition. And so I would like for you to look into your crystal ball, Ken. And I realize none of us has one, but it's fun to 
make some predictions. What do you think is going to have the greatest impact on how we show up to our work and our personal lives over the next, say, five years? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's so many things that can change. And one of the insights that I learned through my silence was impermanence. So I try never to think that anything is going to be how it is forever because everything is impermanent. So I would say the one thing that you can control that will change how you show up in five years to wherever you are is yourself and who you believe you are, what you believe you are, and what you want in the future. And that's something you can control and you know, create alignments to move forward. So in five years, you are where you want to be. Mm-hmm. And so for people listening who are thinking, oh, you know, I've tried meditation. It didn't really work for me. What are your thoughts on that? So I get that question <laughs> all the time. <laughs> or, hey, I was meditating and I had thoughts. I clearly am doing it wrong. And I'm like, did you really think you weren't going to have a thought for 20 minutes? Like, I don't know anybody that's ever done that, you know? So I would say that every meditation is a good meditation because you're creating the muscle memory, if you will, of stillness. And so whether you think you can, you know, realize it yourself or not, like it's having a benefit. And so I'd say just continue to do it. And while you might not notice a difference because you experience yourself every day, the people around you will start to notice a difference in you because obviously there'll be gaps in time between when they see you in time to time. So I would say just, you know, keep meditating. Don't judge it. Don't have an expectation uh, and don't overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. You know, you brought up an interesting point that people have perceptions about what meditation is based on the noise, (laughs) you know, that the, the meditate meditation as an industry has become a thing. And it, it, based on what you've been sharing with us today and also my own studies, is, is a very personal experience. And it, until you actually do it, you're not going to know, right? And, and I like, too, that you're pointing out it's a practice, right? You've got to show up. You don't just do it one time and say, okay, I meditated, <laughs> Right. right. Now I now I've done it. And it, it's it, it really is like anything else. Um, you know, if you want to build more lean muscle mass, you're not going to do that thinking about it or reading a book. You got to go and, pra- you know, practice in the gym, whether it's through lifting weights or it's through yoga or Pilates or, or some way of actually engaging your muscles. And meditation is the same thing. It's, it is building a muscle memory. Exactly. Right. You just got to continually get your mind in that habit of creating that stillness, you know, eventually it'll get to the point where like, if I sit down to meditate, I don't have to set a timer or anything. Like my body naturally knows Mm -hmm. when 20 minutes is up and, you know, I'm like, okay, now we can start my day. Right. You know, there's no, it's just a memory. Right. So how many, how many years now have you been actively practicing your, had your stillness practice? This will be six years. Okay. Six years. Yeah. And I, like I said, I jumped in relatively what I would call aggressively, right? So I read everything I could, was going to retreats a couple of times. And then I did, you know, five days in silence was, which that five days in silence really opened up my eyes to the benefits of stillness. So that was probably the, the key that really embedded the benefit for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, you, you point to experience. You went and experienced something. Yeah, you definitely can't. As a person that read mo- most of the books out there, I can tell you that reading the books was nothing like having the experience. <laughs> Although books still matter. You know, you've written a book and you yes. share your story. And that could be the first stepping stone for somebody uh, along the way, you know, you, and the thing about writing a book and creating a course is you just never know who is going to be engaging with your content and how, what you chose to share 
makes a positive impact on their life. That's the beauty of it. That's the, the beauty of it. And um, I know we're going to get to where people can find your book and course in a, in a minute. But first, Ken, I want to put you in the favorite part of the show, although I love all the show, but this is touchdown. This is when you get to be in the red zone. There are less than 30 seconds left on the clock. You are down by four points. It's third down, which means it's now or never. Tell us a story about a time when you metaphorically got that ball into the end zone for the game winning touchdown. I would say going into the five days of silence. And why I say that is up to that point, right? Like when you get to the red zone, everything gets tighter. Everything is <laughs> closer. The energy's there. And I remember walking into the retreat center to do the five days of silence. And all of a sudden it all became real, right? Not going to have a phone, not going to have TV, internet, no way of communicating with anybody. And you're like, all right, am I really ready to like cross this line and make it happen? And there was so much talk of, hey, you can't do this. You have a business to run. This is happening. Your family, like everything was against me. Like the defense was full on, like they were rushing. and you know, just being able to say, you know what, I'm going to do this leap forward and actually complete that five days was probably, like I said, one of the most impactful guns for me. Maybe I won the Super Bowl with that move. <laughs> um, so that's definitely it. And where did you do your retreat for people who might be curious? You know, where do these things happen? Yes, yeah, so there's different groups that do them. I want to eventually host them because, again, it's kind of my Super Bowl moment. I think that there's so much benefit in doing prolonged silence. Um, but I actually did mine in Pebble Beach. Oh. So right on the coast. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I can picture you like crossing the line into the retreat center and being so aware of what you were about to do. It's something I have not done and have been curious about. You're... I think I've had two other conversations on the show with people who have done, uh, you know, a certain amount of time in silence. And aren't there different lengths of time? There's you did a five day, but could, can't you do up to thirty days? Is or is there an, even a ninety day one out there? I guess you could go as long as you wanted to. <laughs> I guess you could. <laughs> yeah, I have friends that do like Sundays in silence or things like that. I've never gone longer than five days, but what I would say is I don't think that one day is long enough because after a certain amount of time, your, your routines stop. So whether that's five days, 10, seven, uh, whatever it may be, but I don't think that, see, when you say 30 or 90 days, now I'm like, okay, I've like quit my job, <laughs> just closed my company. Like, that's so much. Um, and I don't know the extra benefit that you would get from it. Whereas five days, you can take a couple of days off before, or after the weekend, get it done. You come back so refreshed. And so, yeah, I would say that for me, it was a good five days. I don't think I, I wouldn't want to do 30 at this point because I don't think that I could get other people on that are business owners or entrepreneurs that are trying to grow and have more success in their life mm -hmm. to commit 30 days to do nothing and just disengage. So that's why I personally chose the five days. And I think that other people can do five days too. It's not some overwhelming length of time. Sure. Now, were you allowed to write and read or are you without anything? So it is a personal experience again. So you could do whatever you want. I decided that if I was going to do it, I was going to go all in. So I did not read, write, obviously speak, listen to music, watch TV. I didn't do anything hmm. for five days. Hmm. And so it was basically, I was here witnessing everything, but I didn't have any interaction with anything outside of myself. Wow. 
Well, it, it's an intriguing experience for sure. And, and team, you, you're hearing this now. I mean, if this is on your bucket list or now that you've heard Ken talk about it, be sure to uh, connect with him and um, you're going to be able to do that here in a second. But before we get to that, Ken, could you share with us one to three key offensive strategies straight out of your leadership playbook about finding stillness, about the connection between building wealth and taking care of your own personal journey, whatever you feel would help listeners make some forward progress in their work and life. What could you share? Yeah, I would say first, the key to start right is the stillness. You just have to have enough stillness in your life to hear yourself think and what you want to do. Because I truly believe that with a stillness practice, you can change every aspect of your life. So that is the start. And then I'd say knowing the reason you're doing what you're doing is extremely important to keep you energized. And then don't be afraid to seize the second. And when I say that, what I mean is opportunity for you to move towards your goals or to achieve them, you'll find it in your stillness because you'll be more present. And you have to have the courage to seize that second, allow yourself to move forward and, you know, reach for the goal. Mm -hmm. And so many people are unwilling to, to reach for it or receive whatever it is they're trying to, to do because they're afraid. So those are my three keys. Find your stillness, know why you're doing it and have the courage to seize the second. Mm. Love that. Seize the second. It's fabulous. And so for people who'd like to learn more about your course, learn more about you, where do you hang out online, Ken? Yeah. So you could find me on kencladoris.com and that's spelled K-L-A-D as in David, O-U-R-I-S, kencladoris.com. You can find more information about the course on stillness to success.com. And then I am on Instagram as Ken Cladoris. Okay. So these links team will be on Ken's show notes page over at pyppodcast.com. Follow him on Instagram, check out his course, learn more about what he's doing in the world. It's a really fascinating space to be working in, I think. And I'm really appreciative of you taking us inside your experience in a five day silence retreat and also how you had an epiphany about your life, which sent you on your new quest, which has led you to creating this course. And I know there are people listening who will be at least curious enough to (laughs) want to find out, you know, what, what is this, right? There, there is a connection you're proving it. There's a connection between going deep inside yourself and figuring out your journey and then living a successful life, whatever that looks like to you. Right. And that can include lots and lots of money or maybe just a little bit, you know, just depends. Right. I mean, when I get the question of, you know, what is wealth? I'm like, that is a personal experience again. Like, Everything is up to the individual and you really, right. If you know your position, obviously then you can play your position. If you don't know your position, how are you going to play it? (laughs) Yes. Beautifully said, Ken. Um, And before we say goodbye, tell us who your team is. Since we've been talking about football a little bit today, who do you like to watch on either Saturday or Sunday? Yeah. I'm a big Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Interesting. I did not. Yeah. I expect that. <laughs> Most people don't. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, by the time this airs, we will be getting closer to, you know, fall camp and, and teams. I mean, it, do, it seems like it's a little bit a ways, but boy, summer's going to come and go and we'll be smack in the middle of football season again. And also fall, summer and fall team is a great time for you to take some time for yourself to be still, to explore what you really want, 
from life, the way Ken has so generously shared with us today is possible when you make the decision to put yourself first and really hear yourself think. And for that, Ken, thank you so much for your time today. It's really been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. And you know, thank you to the team for, for listening today. Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year. Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills, they never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now. pypodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's pypodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at pyppodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Got a great key offensive strategy you like to share? Write to us at coach at pyppodcast.com or on Twitter, use hashtag PYP and let us know how you're running your ball into the end zone for those game-winning touchdowns.